like a well-oiled machine. All right. Well, uh, Merry Christmas. Welcome, 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 welcome. Um, go ahead, if you want to, and open your Bibles to John chapter 1. Uh, personally, my favorite Christmas passage, because um, I'm kind of nerdy, and that just gets right down to the uh, theology of it without all of the shepherds and wise men and all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> guess it helps if I also open in my Bible to John chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And despite what many scholars today like to say about the book of Mark, the reason Matthew was first is because it was written first. John, cha sorry. John chapter 1. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, for those of you who were here last night, uh, we talked about the gift that we have been given, right? The Advent season as we have been building up to the coming of Christ. The King is coming. The Messiah is soon to arrive. And then we talked last night about the gift, the precious gift that we are given in Jesus Christ. And so what we're going to do this morning, because it is Christmas morning, and as so many of us uh, throughout the years have probably had the tradition of doing, we unwrap our gifts on Christmas morning. So this morning we're going to uh, unwrap that gift and uh, read the label, right? We're going to do something, guys, that isn't really something we normally do is read the label, you know, open the instructions, see how that goes. Um, but that's what we're going to take a look at because John kind of lays that out for us. Let's go ahead and read uh, a little bit here in John chapter 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness to the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was a true light which gives light to every man. <clears throat> Start that one over. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him to them... He gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So let's take a look at what the Scripture says we received on that Christmas morning what it was that came to us. There are several things that are used to describe Christ and who he is and what he came to do. First, it says that he is the word. What's interesting is, if you rewind the clock 2,000 years, if we were sitting in uh, Israel back then, that word would actually kind of have two meanings in the culture because, you know, around the area, you had two blendings of culture, of the Gentile culture, uh, heavily influenced by Greek philosophy, and then you had the Hebrew culture, uh, you know, from the Old Testament. And so you would have actually kind of a double meaning to that statement of Christ being the Word. Because according to kind of popular philosophy, the, the way people thought, the idea of the Word, right, the Greek term being logos, it actually kind of had wrapped up in it not just a word, not just a statement, but it represented the meaning behind the Word. Right, that actually went a little deeper, and, and, and they would use it to refer to not just the meaning of a specific term, but the meaning of reality the meaning behind it all. 
And they would view the logos as that thing which gives meaning to the universe. Whereas for Jews in the Old Testament, we actually see several places where it refers to the word of the Lord. But it's not quite talking about a message. It seems to be referring to the actual presence of God himself. In Genesis 15, 1, it says that the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram, for I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. The word came and spoke. So the word being a person. 1 Samuel 3, 21, And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh as the word of the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, it says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, that it is the word who came to him. It was the word who formed him. And so we see that the word is being described in kind of personal sense, representing the presence and the power of God. And so whenever you say, and in the beginning was the word, and it's referring to Jesus, it's saying that Jesus is the very presence of God and is also the meaning that undergirds and is behind life itself. This meaning of life has been revealed, and that meaning is God himself, is what John is saying in that short little phrase that starts out his book. You know, what's interesting is the, the meaning of life, right? What's it all about? Of course, we all know that the answer to the ultimate question about life, the universe, and everything is 42. <laughs> Few of you got it. All right, that, that, was, that was a terrible joke. Um, no, the, that little Hitchhiker's Guide joke. Um, the question about meaning, why are we here? What's the purpose? What's it all about? is probably one of the biggest questions that people wrestle with. Even people who aren't really all that deep, it's still something that motivates so much of what we do and why we do it and what we think and why we think it. Who am I? Why am I here? What is this life about? What is my purpose? This is the reason why people will grab at any little thing that's going to seem to promise to give them some kind of meaning. No matter how empty it may appear, no matter how harmful it may end up being, it's something they grab onto because, at least to them, they feel like they have some kind of meaning. Many of the problems that we have in our world today boil down to people seeking that meaning and choosing to follow after things that don't really provide. The idea of racism, the idea that who I am is defined by the color of my skin and my meaning in life is defined by how much pigment I have or don't have. Well, that's ridiculous. That doesn't give you any kind of meaning. People find their meaning in politics, right? People find their meaning, whether it is the L, the G, the B, or the T, whatever it is, they're looking at something that they're saying, that will be my meaning, but it doesn't actually give their life any meaning. Because meaning and purpose is not something that you can pick and choose. It's not like a cafeteria. It's not like you can just go and find, oh, I like that one. That one will be my meaning. Meaning and purpose is something that is inherent to who you are and what you are. And who and what you are is defined by your creator. Only the creator can give a purpose. Now, I might be able to take my screwdriver and bash a hammer in with the handle, but that's not its purpose. That's not what it's meant for. How do I know that's not what it's meant for? Because the person who designed it said it's not for bashing in nails, it's for turning screws. And in the same way, your creator has designed you for a purpose, and sure, you might be able to, in a pragmatic sense, go find something else to use yourself for in some other meaning, but that's not really who you are and where your meaning is found. The meaning of life is found in the person of Jesus Christ, whom we are created for and whom is our creator. Because it says in verse 3 of John 1, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that has been made. He is the creator of all things. 
Now, much can be said about the fact that Jesus is the creator of all things. However, what I want to focus on is the fact that if he is the creator, if he is, has the power and the ability to create, well, then certainly he has the ability to, to recreate. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, that old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. In Christ, we are made new. Those of us, um, and, and I can't claim this myself, but you know, those of you who came to Christ later in life, you know the transformation that can take place of the life you're living, walking in sin and the destruction you're wreaking upon yourself and those around you. But then you come to Christ and you're made new. You see that transformation. No longer defined by our sin and our pride, we are set free to live a new life in Christ. Because that is where life is to be found. John 1.4 says that in him was life, and the life is the light of men. And so in Christ, we receive life. And we need life because in the beginning, right? Remember, we all know the story. God creates a garden, puts Adam and Eve in the garden, says, here's these two trees. Don't eat from that one. And we like to focus on the one that he says don't eat from, right? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which, of course, they go in, they eat, and they get kicked out of the garden. But what was the other tree? It was the tree of life. And so they had access to life and to God. But then, because of the choice, mankind exiled from God's presence, exiled from the garden, and now cut off from life, we have death. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned. And because all have sinned, as Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Because of sin, we inherit death. But because of Christ, we can have life. And it's not just that Christ is life, but that life that he gives, it is a light to all mankind. John 1, 4 through 9, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness to the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man who's coming into the world. It's interesting, uh, Christ being described as being light. There's a famous quote by C.S. Lewis. He says, I believe in Christianity the same way I believe the sun has risen. Not just because I see it, but because of it, I see everything else. And whenever you know Christ, the world opens up. You're able to see things the way they are. Christ is the light by which we clearly see the world as it really is. Not as how we want to imagine it to be. The light which exposes Every little flaw and stain. You ever have somewhere where you need to change a light bulb? Or, you know, maybe one's gone out or maybe it's a little dim. Or maybe you put in a different light bulb, you bought the wrong kind, and all of a sudden, boom, it's brighter. And all of a sudden, you can see everywhere. There's a little stain on the carpet there. There's a little crack in the paint over there. There's some dirt that was hiding over there under that I never saw before. And all of a sudden, you see all the things that are wrong and need to be cleaned up and fixed and because the light had shown you what was there. And so the light of Christ does in our lives. That as he shines into our hearts, we see all that is going on because the light of Christ exposes lies and it shows us truth. The fact is, there's lots of lies that we prefer to believe, but whenever we come face to face with Jesus Christ, we have to admit that they are wrong. The idea that we're all basically good people. Now, I think most of y'all probably have developed some pretty good habits of being, you know, basically decent folks. But as we all know, inside of us, there is at least a kernel of selfishness and pride that we more often than we care to admit act on. There's a lie that it doesn't matter what you believe. It's popular around the culture. Well, just have faith in something. It doesn't matter. Just believe whatever. Of course, it matters very much so if what you believe is false. There is only one truth, 
That's another lie. We are told that truth is found within us, that you have your truth, and you have your truth, and I have my truth, and everybody has their own truth, and we get to live our own truth. That's not how truth works. Truth is the way reality actually is. Whatever you want to believe about it, however you feel about it, whether you accept it or not, believe it or not, it's still true regardless. Truth is that which is real, whether you know it or not, and we can find the truth of life's big questions only in Christ. Because as John 1.17 says, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The biggest question that we wrestle with, even bigger than the question of meaning, is the question of what do we do with the guilt that we carry? heard one person uh, giving a talk, uh, I think it was on a college campus, and he said, you know, people try to figure out what to do with the guilt, that we feel guilty about stuff. And he goes, well, you want to know why you feel guilty? Because you're guilty. There's not some big, you know, mystery to it. The reason why we feel burdened with guilt over the bad things we do is because we've done bad things. And what do we do with that guilt? People walk around trying to figure out, what is my meaning? Well, that meaning is only found in your creator. But then we also know our selfishness, our pride, the bad things that we do. Oftentimes, the ones we hurt the most are the ones we love. Fact is, chances are, no one's lied to you as much as you've lied to yourself. We know we're guilty, so what do we do with that guilt? Where do we find our meaning? What do we do with our guilt? Christ is the answer to both of those. When the light of Christ shines into the darkness of our lives, we see the truth of our sin. And often the instinct of people when that is revealed is to recoil, usually motivated by one of two things, either because they love their sin and they want to go on walking in it, living in it, lying to themselves about it actually being good. They want to be able to deny it. Or there are those who recognize their sin for what it is, but they recoil in horror, not wanting to face it. But denying it doesn't make it go away. Fact is, mankind is actually pretty terrible people when you get right down to it. I mean, sure, we have all the petty things that we do, the selfishness, the envy, right, some vengefulness and holding grudges and, you know, whenever you drink the last bit of milk and leave like that much in the bottom, those sorts of things. I mean, we have those going on. But coming from that same kernel of selfishness and pride isn't just those little, you know, kind of social faux pas that we tend to do, but also from that same selfish, prideful motivation comes the things that we would consider the bigger sins, corruption, war, oppression, abuse. Did you know, an interesting book uh, by a Dr. Clay Jones, He mentions he did a study of um, atrocities and genocides and all that kind of wonderful things. Um, In every account of genocide he found, regardless of who was writing it, whether it was the victims or whether it was the perpetrators, every single one of them says the people who commit those atrocities, they're not a special breed of evil. They're just regular people. Often when we think of that kind of wickedness, we go straight to the Holocaust, so there are others. But you know, the Holocaust could not have happened without the participation of and the acceptance and the allowance of regular people. They have discovered and cataloged over 44,000 internment camps. You have the major camps that we all know of, like Auschwitz, but then they have all these other little satellite support camps, 44,000 camps in a space barely larger than half the size of Texas. You realize Germany is about half the size of Texas, 44,000 camps in Germany. You don't get that without regular folks coming in, punching a clock, whether it's the file clerk or the guard who's abusing the prisoners, they're all helping to make it happen. Whether we're talking about that in Germany or the abuses in China, the Atlantic slave trade, communist Russia, the genocide in Rwanda, or the killing fields in Cambodia. No matter what you want to look at, the people who were doing that were just regular folks like you and me. Not some special breed of evil. And you're probably thinking to yourself, uh, Pastor, thank you for such a cheerful Christmas message. 
<clears throat> but here's the thing. The cheer of the Christmas message is that grace was given to people who were capable of such horrible evils. That's why there's cheer. That's why we celebrate. That's why the baby in the manger is such a wonderful, gracious gift because that is the horrible things that we are capable of. And even the horrible things that we do that don't make those kind of headlines, we know that we are guilty. And yet, we receive love and grace. See, our sin is the dark backdrop against which the light of the gift of Christ shines. You ever go into a jewelry store? Everything's laid out, and they're probably on some kind of black or dark blue material, and they got a little shiny thing sitting on there. And they put them on that dark background because on that dark background, they glisten and shine all the more bright. Our sin is the dark background. And the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ shines all that much more brightly whenever we realize the depth of our sin. A preacher by the name of John Bradford back in the 1500s, as the story goes, he's walking down the street and he sees a line of criminals, of prisoners, being hauled off to execution. And as the story goes, he looks upon them and he says, There but for the grace of God go I. The only difference between me and them is the grace that I have received, because that could have been me. And that is within every single one of us. And it is in Christ that we have been extended a graciousness and a love and a forgiveness for the sin that resides in each and every one of us. For all who would turn away from that sinfulness and follow the one who created us and who gives our lives meaning. The only one, Christ, who is capable of giving us new life. We turn from the darkness and we choose to walk in the light. In the light of hope, which shone across the world from a manger in a little town called Bethlehem. That little church on Liberty Hill, come praise the Lord. Let your cup be filled. Raise your voices and we'll sing. Let God's freedom ring from that little church on liberty.